Following up from the last PowerPoint, can you spot which two um, white blood cells are those? One on the left has the big spherical nucleus, and the one on the right has the kidney being shaped. Yeah, the one on the left, that's a lymphocyte. The one on the right is a monocyte. All right. Let's talk about making more white blood cells. So remember, how did we make more white blood cells? Or even further back than that, what cell can turn into all formed elements? There's one stem cell, all right? A hemopoietic stem cell that turns into all the formed elements. Now, how does it know who to turn into? Well, in the presence of erythropoietin, that stem cell will turn into red blood cells. In the presence of thrombopoietin, it will turn into platelets. Well, as it turns out, there's no leukopoietin. There's no hormone that tells that stem cell to turn into white blood cells. What do you suppose would be the trigger? I mean, think about it. When do you need white blood cells? You need white blood cells when you've been infected by something. And so that's actually the trigger. So leukopoiesis means the production of white blood cells stimulated by two families of glycoproteins from the bone marrow and also from mature white blood cells. So when you get an infection, um, white blood cells start releasing little proteins called interleukins. Inter means between, leuk, leukocyte. So these are little communicators that go in between leukocytes. They're how leukocytes talk to one another. So interleukin 1, interleukin 2, there's up to, there's at least like 20 um, interleukins. I don't know, I don't keep track of that kind of stuff, but I know there's at least like 20 of them. So interleukins are how white blood cells talk to one another. They also have these things called colony stimulating factors. And it's the colony stimulating factors that go to the red bone marrow. <coughs> Sorry, I got the rona. And they tell the stem cells to turn into white blood cells. <coughs> so there are granulite colony stimulating factors. Those tell the um, hematopoietic stem cell to turn into basophils, uh, neutrophils, and eosinophils. And then there's a granulocyte colony stimulating factor that tells the stem cell to turn into monocytes and leukocytes. They can act as either paracrines or hormones. Remember from Bio 156, paracrines basically go cell to cell. They're local messengers. Hormones travel long distance by going through the blood. All leukocytes originate from those hemocytoblasts, those hemopoietic stem cells. And it all takes place in the red bone marrow. <clears throat> well, it occurs at least a lot in the red bone marrow and in lymphoid tissues. <clears throat> Here you see the two stem cell lines. I asked about this in the homework. A lot of people gave wrong answers. There's the myeloid stem cell line and the lymphoid stem cell line. Lymphoid stem cell line only makes lymphocytes. The myeloid stem cell line turns into eosinophils, basophils, neutrophils, monocytes, and um, yeah. So there you go. Which of the following statements is true regarding the mechanism controlling movement of white blood cells into damaged tissues? So A, capillaries break open, flooding the area with white blood cells. B, leukopoiesis occurs in the damaged tissues. C, hemopoiesis occurs in the damaged tissues. D, white blood cells exit the capillary and follow a chemical trail. Or E, none of the above. And yeah... It's that diapedesis and then the positive chemotaxis. The white blood cells squeeze out and then they sniff out the bad guys. Okay, we've talked about red blood cells. We've talked about white blood cells. Let's talk about platelets. That was the third type of formed element. Platelets are small fragments of megakaryocytes. So there in the bottom left, you see a megakaryocyte. That cell essentially explodes. It just bursts open and leaves all kinds of fragments behind. And those fragments are the platelets. So platelets are not whole cells. Platelets are just chunks of a cell. Formation regulated by thrombopoietin, all right? That's the hormone that tells the hemocytoblast to turn into a megakaryocyte. The granules have all kinds of things in them in this case. So serotonin, thromboxane A2, ADP, calcium, platelet-derived growth factor, and various clotting factors. And we'll be talking about all those coming up, okay? So platelets, remember, what's their job? You, know, you had one job. Platelets, their job is to help blood clot. 
And so all those things in the granules are going to be helping blood clot, all right? And we're going to, you know, you need to know what those things do, okay? So platelets, um, they form a temporary platelet plug that helps seal breaks in blood vessels. So in the upper left there, you can see you get a damage, an injury to a, a blood vessel. What happens is platelets start to collect. They, they gather together in the area where the damage happened, and they form what's called the platelet plug. Now the platelet plug is just temporary. That's to basically stop the bleeding long enough to go ahead and form the actual clot, and then to repair the blood vessel so that it won't continue to leak. So platelets, the first job, what they do is they make the platelet plug. They stop. It's like the, the old the story of the little Dutch boy who put his finger in the dike. Dike meaning the big dam. Careful the way you talk about that. Circulating platelets are usually kept inactive and mobile by nitric oxide and prostacycline from endothelial cells of blood vessels. So think about it. <clears throat> Since platelets can gather together and make plugs that will turn into clots, um, that could potentially be dangerous. You don't want there to be just random clots forming in your blood vessels. So how do we make sure that you don't form spurious random clots all the time? Well, nitric oxide is one and prostacycline is another. Um, think of prostacycline basically as like Teflon. You know, like those are like those no-stick pans. They have that special coating so the stuff doesn't stick. So prostacycline is normally there, and that keeps the platelets from sticking so that you don't form just random blood clots, okay? And there's a mega, sh a mega karyocyte shedding platelets, all right? All those little things um, just break off. They are released by the mega karyocyte, and those are the platelets full of all those granules. So let's talk about hemostasis. Don't uh, confuse this word with homeostasis. Totally different word. Hemostasis, so in both, stasis means the state. It means basically to stay the same. Here, hemo means blood. So um, you want your blood to achieve a certain constant state. That's hemostasis, all right? This is a fast series of reactions for stopping bleeding. And it consists of three basic steps. The first is vascular spasm. So when a blood vessel is injured, um, the blood vessel actually spasms and contracts. Muscle, smooth muscle contracts. And so it clamps down. All right, It automatically does that. That's called vascular spasm. Then the platelet plug forms. All right, The temporary plug to stop the bleeding then finally we have the actual coagulation which is the formation of the blood clot <clears throat> so look on the left side there you can see <clears throat> that's an actual blood clot all those sort of teal shaped fibers um, those are fibrin fibers and that's actually the clot a clot is basically just like a giant net and what it does is it catches everything that's floating in the blood including red blood cells and platelets and all white blood cells all that stuff just like a giant net that catches everything, and then that makes the clot, all right? So to remember hemostasis, I say remember, squeeze it, then plug it, then clot it, all right? Squeeze it, plug it, clot it. Squeeze it, plug it, clot it. Squeeze it, vascular spasm. Plug it, make the platelet plug. Clot it, actually form the blood clot. That's coagulation, okay? So those are the three steps. I'm going to ask you about those. You watch. I'm going to ask you. Tell me the three steps of hemostasis. And don't tell me squeeze it, plug it, clot it. You need to say vascular spasm, platelet plug formation, and coagulation. Squeeze it, plug it, clot it is just to help you remember, okay? So let's look at the first one. Squeeze it, vascular spasm. This is vasoconstriction of a damaged blood vessel, triggered by direct injury, all right, so injury itself will trigger this, pain reflexes will do this, and also chemicals released by endothelial cells and platelets. In particular, serotonin, ADP, and thromboxane A2 all promote vascular spasm. That's the point. Serotonin, this is where serotonin was originally <clears throat> discovered. <clears throat> Most of your serotonin is in your intestines and in your blood. Um, only like 2% of your serotonin is in the brain. Serotonin was discovered in the blood originally. Serotonin literally means sero serum, like the plasma 
essentially of blood. Tonin means like pressure. So basically serotonin was something that controlled blood pressure. That's how it was named because it causes vascular spasm. It causes the blood vessel to constrict down, which when that happens, that makes blood pressure go up. So then ADP and also thromboxane A2. These are all powerful chemicals that help the blood vessel constrict. So you see there on the left, <coughs> you see the blood vessel clamping down, constricting. In the, in the bottom left, look at how there's been damage to a blood vessel, and then look at the slide that shows. See how part of the blood vessel has gotten really skinny? Yeah, that's where vascular spasm is happening. So that's all being created by the injury, the pain reflexes, the release of serotonin, ADP, thromboxane A2, all of those are causing that blood vessel to clamp down to try to limit the loss of blood, okay? So step one, vascular spasm, squeeze it. Step two, plug it, platelet plug formation. This is a positive feedback loop. Now remember in, in Bio 201, we talked about positive and negative feedback loops. We really didn't see any positive feedback loops in Bio 201 except the action potential. We're gonna see a few different ones in Bio 202. So here's one, <coughs> oh, that Rona, um, positive feedback loop. Um, at the site of the blood vessel injury, platelets, um, they stick to exposed collagen fibers. Remember collagen, a protein found in tissue. Um, when the blood vessel is injured, collagen fibers ex expose, they get exposed, they stick out. <clears throat> and there's this thing con called von Willebrand factor. It's a plasma protein, another one of those plasma proteins, and it helps the platelets stick to the exposed collagen fibers. So they swell, these fibers do, they become spiked and sticky, and they also release chemical messengers, such as ADP, serotonin, thromboxin A2, and calcium as well. Those all enhance the platelet aggregation. So in, in essence, what happens is, when the blood vessel is injured, the von Willebrand factor makes it sort of sticky, and then the platelets start to stick to it, okay? <clears throat> there you see in the lower left, the platelet plug blocking up a vessel, and uh, in the lower, in, in the middle, you see there a blood vessel's been damaged, and there we see all the platelets forming together, all right? And then finally, clotted coagulation. So this is a set of reactions in which blood is transformed from a liquid to a gel. You know, just like that stuff you put in your hair. So blood goes from a liquid to being this kind of gooey stuff. That's what happens when you coagulate blood. It becomes gooey. Reinforces the platelet plug with fibrin threads. So fibrin is a, uh, comes from a plasma protein. Relies on many clotting factors and other pro-coagulants. So these are all things, if you look in the bottom uh, right there, you got all these things that are out there floating around in your blood all the time. Notice prothrombin, thrombin, fibrinogen, fibrin, all the different clotting factors, factor 7, factor 7A, factor 9, and so on. Those are all the things that work together um, to form the coagulation, to form the clot. There are three phases here. First, prothrombin activator is formed via what are called the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways. Those basically have to do with damage to the tissue. So damage to the tissue causes you to make something called prothrombin activator. Prothrombin activator converts prothrombin into thrombin. So thrombin, as we're gonna see coming up, thrombus is a clot. A thrombus is a clot. So thrombin is the molecule that causes the clot to form. And what does thrombin do? Thrombin takes fibrinogen, which is a plasma protein, it's always in your blood, and thrombin turns fibrinogen into fibrin. And fibrin, fibrin is actually what makes the mesh or the net. So in the upper right, see, see the, how, what it looks like, a big net there? Those are strands of fibrin. That's how it all works, okay? So <clears throat> notice all the clotting factors. 13 clotting factors. And um, notice fibrin fibrinogen is clotting factor number one, clotting factor, um, prothrombin, clotting factor number two. And then you have these platelet factors as well. So all of these things have to work together to cause the formation of a blood clot. 